Hello and welcome to Console Cowboys. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at public and private key cryptography, hashing, signing, and all the things that make up transactions before we pull down those transactions in the next video with ethers.js. So if you don't care about the learning portion and you just wanna code, go to the next video. This is not the video for you. But since this is a basic series, I'm gonna be covering these types of things in between coding or in between exploitation of something. So on the screen, we have the block that we pulled down in the last video. And within this block, we have our list of transactions. We have an array of transaction hashes. Now, if we look up these transaction hashes using etherscan.io, so I'm just gonna plug that in there and it'll bring up the transaction. Now this happened two days and three hours ago because that's when we pulled down the block and it successfully worked, right? Here's the transaction hash that we pushed in. And there's a lot of details in here, but what we're gonna look at first is we have our from and our to fields. Now those are our public keys where we are holding value and sending value to. So in the blockchain, we have public and private key pairs, kind of like in the cryptography world of asymmetric encryption, right? So you have a private key that you keep private and you use that to sign transactions or to encrypt data. And you have a public key, which you hand out to everybody, and they can verify a signature of something that you sign, or they can send value to that public key. Let's first take a look at a website similar to the last one we had, where we had some blockchain demos, right? So right here, um, this is a signature demo. We have a sign and we have a verify, and we have a private key here. Now, if I type in a message, say the message test, what it's gonna do is it's gonna take this private key and it's going to sign the message test and give us a message signature down here. So with this signature, we can verify that it came from our private key without actually knowing what the private key is. And the way we do that is with the public key that we can hand out to everybody. So in the verify screen, we still have our message test we have our public key we can use to verify that this signature is correct using the value of test. If we hit verify, everything goes green. However, if we start modifying things such as the message, then this will no longer validate because the public key can't validate that TESR was signed to create a signature using that value because that's not what we used. So we can go back to test and it should verify because now we have the correct value that the private key signed to get that signature that our public key can actually verify that the private key was used. We can also try to change the signature. So if we left the message the same, but we changed the signature, this will also not verify. So there's a direct correlation between the data that is signed in this case, the word test with our private key, we can verify that with the public key without knowing the private key based on the signature and the data. And that's how cryptography works, right? So the public key can be derived from the private key. You can create these public keys, but you can't go backwards. So cryptography is based on hard problems and the hard problems in digital signatures is the fact that you can't figure out what the private key is based on the public key. So if you hold your private key um, safe, you can sign transactions with it. So let's look at the way this works with a transaction. Pretty much the exact same way. So here I have a transaction. It's $20. It's going from this address to this address. And I'm using my private key to sign the transaction saying, hey, I'm verifying I wanna send $20 to this for CC and I own this wallet. So what will happen is I hit sign and it creates a signature based on the value, where it's going, where it's coming from and all the data. And now if I verify that on the other end, or in this case, maybe a miner verifies it before putting it on a block, everything looks good. However, if I decided to change the value because I'm a hacker, all of a sudden that signature is not gonna work and it's gonna get rejected. So, the way this would work on the blockchain is we have all these values here and they're all mined, right? Everything's in green, just like the last videos that we watched on the blocks. 
And if I was to change the value here to 11 instead of 10, it kills the blocks, right? Now it's saying something's wrong because the data within this block doesn't match the uh, hash of this whole block, which is correct. We know that. And we hit mine. Now, once this mines, it should say, yeah, all the data in this block matches this hash, matches the data, the nouns, all of that hash together matches whatever the hash is down here. So we'll wait for that to come back. So that came back. However, the hash is correct and the difficulty matches whatever the difficulty is. In this case, one, two, three, four, five zeros in the front. And all of this data hashed together matches this hash and we could just mine every block after that and those should be okay. However, the value that we changed on this transaction, the signature is now red, even though the block is good to go, the signature on this transaction is wrong. So it's not going to actually work. We can't actually change this transaction because the transaction is protected by the signature of the private key of the person who owns this from wallet. But this was changed in transit, which killed the signature. However, when the block was mined, all of this data in it hashed together with the nouns matches the hash. So the block itself is okay, but the transaction is going to be rejected. Hopefully that makes sense. And now that starts tying into other things like, okay, where are these private keys being held, right? So in blockchain, a lot of times what you'll see is various tools such as MetaMask. So if I sign back into this VM here, if I go to say mycrypto.com and I hop in here and I go to MetaMask and connect it, I have this hooked up to the Ropstein network, which is a test network. And I used a faucet to grab some um, actual currency to play around with. It's not real currency, but I have nine ether here and I have two in this other account. So I'm gonna connect in here. And once this is connected, I can interact with this website via Web3. Now in this case, it's similar to that first one we saw with the message. So if I type in my message of test and I hit sign, what it's gonna say is, well, as this website, I don't know how to sign this, but I'm gonna connect via Web3 over to MetaMask. And in MetaMask, we actually have our private keys for our account. So it'll say, hey, here's a signature request, right? So I'm gonna say, oh, okay, the message test. Yep, that looks all good. I'm just gonna sign this transaction. And once I sign this transaction, here is our address, which is the 1BF, and that matches our address within Mask. It's taking a minute to actually load up here. Okay, so this 1BF right here, you can barely see it. You might not be able to see it on my screen, but it's there. Um, if I was to copy that, and paste it up here maybe. See uh, 1BF ends in 05A. So that's our address right here, uh, 1BF 05A. And then our message of test. And we are going to sign that using our private key within MetaMask, which creates this signature. Now the signature is how we verify that this message came from address using the message test. So if we copy this here, put it into the verify tab, we can go in here and we can verify. Now we don't have access to our private key in here. It's not gonna load up our MetaMask this time, but because we have the signature and we have the address and we have the message and all the values that were used to create that signature, we can verify that this particular address is associated with the private key that signed it. So I hit that, it verifies it. But if we change its address at all, I change maybe uh, this one to a two and I try to hit verify, it's gonna reject it because the message was not signed by 2BF whatever, whatever is associated with that, it's private key. So if we change that back and hit one, it'll verify again. And the same thing goes for the signature. If I change the signature at all, so I change that from a seven to an eight and hit verify, it's gonna deny it. And that's basically how that works. So another thing to think about too is if you had a Ledger hardware wallet, it's the same way. You hooked it up to your MetaMask, and then when your MetaMask loads up to sign it, it can't sign it in MetaMask because it's hooked up through your Ledger, so it'll pop up on your hardware wallet and say, hey, this uh, signature request is coming through. You click those two buttons on your hardware wallet, and then it passes it back to MetaMask, signed, and then it sends it on, and that's how you keep your keys private within your wallet. 
And that's the difference between using your own wallet and using something like Coinbase or Celsius where they froze withdrawals last week and you can't get your money out because as they say, not your keys, not your crypto, so you're not in control of signing those messages. Hopefully all of this is useful. And in the next video, we're gonna take a look at grabbing those transactions with ethers.js. I'm kind of intermingling all of these concepts within the coding, so that way it's good for newcomers and also to fill in some knowledge gaps.